So we'll be talking about environmental justice, climate, air pollution, and decisions in the U.S. power sector. And, and really, this is at the intersection of the research that I do and my group does, which focus on engineering and economic feasibility of low-carbon, sustainable, affordable, and socially just energy systems via the efficient use and supply of energy. And of course, as we think about the future in sustainable energy systems, it becomes important to consider also the role that policy plays. So part of the group also focuses on understanding the implications of different designs of regulations and policies, both in the context of what they achieve and whether they are meeting the intended goals, as well as understanding and quantifying unintended consequences that may emerge from policy design. And finally, we're looking at these transitions in the context of people that make decisions, that use technology, that select technologies. And so a third stream of research really has to do with the way people make decisions and how they behave. And the emphasis in much of the work from my group has been to uh, quantify environmental justice effects associated with transitions in uh, the energy system. Now, uh, this is really an, an, an the work that is being uh, generated thanks to a phenomenal group of graduate students from different programs uh, here at Stanford, as well as a couple of folks at Carnegie Mellon University uh, across a series of departments from Energy Resources Engineering, uh, the YIPER program, uh, uh, MSNE, uh, CE, and just to name a few. Um, and so let's let's look at the big picture first. This is new news. We need energy to have the types of systems that we have today. We have enormous benefits uh, uh, arising from from energy systems in terms of uh, heading where we'd like to go, in terms of having a warm or cold environment to live in, in terms of storing food and so on and so on. And all those enormous benefits come also at uh, some costs and costs to climate damages as well as health damages from breathing polluted air if we continue to rely on fossil fuels and damages to the environment and ecosystems. So we have this sort of two dimensions that have uh, raised a lot of importance in the policy design spectrum. One is climate change uh, impacts associated with our energy systems, and the other one is health damages from air pollution. And those two things are quite different, both in their treatment and their implications, their temporal aspects, and who will suffer from the damages associated with climate change and health damages. So when you think about uh, the production of electricity, we'll have different steps from mining to fuel extraction and transport to the emissions on site that come with generating power. And we'll have two different streams of uh, pollutants of interest to this research. One is greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane. And those will have a global dispersion, will stay for a very long time in the atmosphere. And so then treatment is really on consequences over very large time horizons. And then we have health damaging air pollutants, and those are namely SO2, NOx, and PM2.5. And so we have different streams of pollutants, uh, the fuel combustion. Uh, will emit both PM2.5 directly, which is called the primary PM, as well as emissions of sulfur dioxide, uh, NOx, uh, which may react with ammonia in the atmosphere and form secondary PM. So throughout this seminar, as I mentioned, PM or PM2.5, I'm really thinking about this combination of secondary PM formation and primary PM uh, that have both impacts on health damages. So, and then are we really concerned about just where does the concentration of this pollutant increase? Not really. We're, we're really worried about the impacts associated with PM2.5. And so that means understanding where the concentration is increasing, but also who is exposed. So think about this very uh, dirty coal power plant that is in the middle of nowhere and where the dispersion is such that it doesn't affect any uh, uh, densely populated or mildly populated areas will have a much lower impact than potentially uh, vehicles that are emitting damages, uh, pollutants at ground level source, but in a very highly densely populated area. So just a quick question. Yes. Isn't the concentration of ammonia in the atmosphere pretty minimal? Uh, the concentration is minimal, but the, it has important implications in the reaction and the formation of PM2.5. Okay. Um, 
So the, the question was whether the concentration of ammonia would matter in the overall outcomes. And so we would want to understand the health damages from, from air pollution, which will depend on where the concentration of PM will be increasing and how many people are impacted by that increase of pollution. And in contrast to GHGs, these types of pollutants will have a very short time in the atmosphere. Meaning if we turn off the knob and stop emitting SO2 NOx and PM2.5, we could quickly get a handle on the damages that are associated with air pollution. In contrast, even if we turn off the knob for greenhouse gases, we're already committed to a massive problem given their persistence in the atmosphere. Not only that, but the dispersion of those pollutants is uh, will depend on the type of um, industrial or emitting facility that we're talking about. So things like power plants will emit primarily SO2 and NOx and will have a wide dispersion. And by wide dispersion, I really mean uh, crossing state boundaries, uh, as we'll see in a little bit. And then you have other sources of emissions like industrial facilities that will emit SO2 and other hazardous air pollutants, which have medium to wide dispersion. And finally, things like trucks and cars, which will primarily emit NOx, and those will be at ground level. And again, I mean, a truck may be more highly polluted, polluting than a car, but if it is in a highway with no one around and there is no congestion, the impact may possibly be lower than a vehicle in a densely populated area. So all of those trade-offs come into play, and those are things that we've tried to quantify. And um, so we, we looked at this issue of trying to understand the demographic and environmental justice implications associated with the U.S. electricity sector. This is work that has been done in collaboration with a phenomenal group of researchers who are very fortunate to collaborate with them, Manny Derpin, Chris Tesson, and Julian Marshall. And so folks had looked previously at the premature mortality associated with electric, electricity production in the United States and elsewhere, but what hasn't hadn't been the focus of attention was, okay, how do these impacts uh, differ by demographics by income, by race and ethnicity. So we kind of added that layer. Um, zooming just out, I'm sorry, just a second as I cannot see the headings of my own slides. Okay, here we go. Um, this looks good here. Um, so in terms of the broad um, scope of the problem, uh, PM 2.5 is the largest environmental health problem in the U.S. and globally. So overall, in just looking at the U.S. and at PM from all sources, it accounts for more than 100,000 fatalities per year. And electricity generation is still a significant contributor to the problem, primarily owing to the production of electricity from coal power plants. Even if that contribution has declined over time, so owing to environmental regulations that require the addition of air pollution control uh, technologies on the stack of power plants. And the fact that we've been transitioning away from coal and adding natural gas, thanks to very cheap natural gas prices, and then to a lesser extent, also thanks to the increased share of renewables in the grid. The, the two other factors kind of dominate the decline on the damages from the power sector that, that we've been seeing. And so as I hinted at previously, there were estimates of PM 2.5 uh, related mortality from electricity production. They have a wide range from uh, 10,000 to 52,000 premature deaths per year. And this really depends on which year is being modeled, which model is being used, uh, and uh, all sorts of other uh, details and designs. In particular, the assumptions that the modeler uses for the relationship between an increase in concentration of PM and the impacts to health or the dose response function associated with pollutants. And to date, the demographic distributions of resulting exposure uh, is, is still largely unknown. We try to contribute to that by looking at the exposures to and health impacts of PM 2.5 from electricity generation in the US. Uh, we looked at uh, the seven regional transmission organizations, or RTOs, and for each of the states and from and to a state, as well as by income and race. 
then uh, is it just like you know if someone is complaining about the sound on 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 the internet? Now, how do we compute those damages? We use what uh, are called integrated assessment models. And so what those models do is that they couple spatially resolved emissions data with reduced complexity models of the atmosphere, and they compute first and foremost the baseline concentrations of PM2.5 at each location. Uh, and several groups of colleagues have been pushing forward the reduced form uh, models and um, folks like myself are users of those models and generally contrast against the different AIMs that have been uh, developed to quantify the damages from air pollution. And so the way this model is run is that first and foremost, you really need a very detailed inventory of emissions. So this is like annual emissions at every single power plant, industrial facility, or ground level emissions in the case of transportation ask to capture all emission sources that you may have in a geographical location like the United States and with a resolution that is predefined by location. And so that gives you both uh, on the emissions by pollutant and location. And then by running this model with all sources of pollution, uh, you uh, have the simulated PM2.5 concentration at different uh, locations. And from that, we can see, okay, what are the premature deaths associated overall with these levels of pollution? But now, how do we attribute the damages to different sources and different locations of pollution? So what we do is that after the baseline run, start doing the perturbation at the time for every single source of pollution. So we go to a power plant located in Allegheny County and we increase the amount of emissions for a specific pollutant by a ton rerun the model again and compute the difference in concentrations of PM across the entire country that are due to that point source emission of one additional marginal ton. And you go on and do that for all the facilities that you have information for or for ground uh, area sources. So that's the next step in terms of understanding the change in concentration of pollution. But as I mentioned, we're not as much worried about the concentration issues, but the implications of that concentration so the next step is to understand what that means in terms of premature mortality. So it's a function that relates the change in concentration at the location with the entailed additional mortality that that induces. So that's the dose response function. And multiply that by the population that is exposed to that pollution. Um, once we have uh, those sorts of information, the layer that we added was census information on self-reported race and ethnicity by population, by block group, as well as household income data. And uh, with that information, we can start looking at, okay, who is impacted and how by the different sources of pollution. And so I'll jump to the very high level result, uh, results first. Our own estimate is that more than 60,000 uh, people die prematurely every year uh, due to electricity generation related emissions. This amounts to an average of four premature deaths per terawatt hour of electricity generated. And 85% of uh, those premature deaths are located and attributable to electricity generated units that are within an RTO, and I'll show the maps of the RTOs in just a little bit. And 90% of the premature mortality is due to electricity generation from coal electricity generating units. So even if there is a decline on emissions overall from coal electricity, they are still the dominant source of premature mortality. A little bit about uh, this, this figures. So on the uh, right, we have uh, the RTO boundaries, just to understand where those major entities are, are uh, their names and the share of coal in their overall electricity generation. And in the table on, on the left, we have uh, a few details related to those units. So we see that uh, MISO, which is this sort of dark blue, and PGM, the navy blue, where coal is still uh, pretty prevalent, are also markets that are very large. So uh, they produce the largest amount of electricity and providing that service. Those are also the RTOs that have the largest amount of premature mortality, both in absolute terms and in terms of premature mortality per terawatt hour 
of electricity produced. The other note, no, noteworthy one is SPP. So SPP is this olive green region here in the middle, which is a smaller market, but uh, the share of coal in the overall production is still fairly large. And the premature mortality per terawatt hour is also uh, on the top three, as uh, actually second to just myself. Um, so that's in terms of big picture. And now let's look at the issue of how do these results differ by race and ethnicity? So here in the vertical axis, I'm showing premature mortality per 100,000 people for premature mortality related to the emissions uh, from electricity generating units for both primary and secondary PM. On the horizontal axis, we show the, the groups of race and uh, ethnicity. And so across the United States, on average, air pollution from electricity generation has as a consequence uh, 5.3 premature deaths per 100,000 people. But when we start looking at this in the perspective of different race and ethnicity, we see that Black African American have uh, higher rates of premature deaths uh, per 100,000 people, followed by white non-Latino, with the other uh, groups having lower exposure and premature mortality. And one may wonder, okay, how is this differentiated by income um, are we all breathing the same air, or is it the case that there are segments of the population that are breathing more, less polluted air than, than others? So here in the vertical axis, we have the same thing, premature mortality per 100,000 people related to emissions from electricity generating units. And on the, your horizontal axis, we have household income groups in $1,000. And first, We'll look at the average across the U.S. for different income group segments. And what we see is that there is a slight decline. The kink is just an issue of my animation. There is no kink here between the, the, the lines. So that people, uh, households with higher income are located in regions uh, where they are less exposed to air pollution than uh, low-income households. But it's a mild decline. In contrast, when we look at layered different uh, race and ethnicity uh, self-reported groups, we see that across all income segments, um, Black African American are more exposed uh, than the other groups to the consequences of air pollution, followed by the white non latino and where the bubbles correspond to um, the number of people that are in that income bracket in the United States. Now, that's one layer of distributional effects, and now we'll move on to another one, and that one has to do with where the pollution is generated and who suffers the damages from pollution across states. So in this first panel, I'm showing the premature mortality in the state related to emissions from electricity generation, regardless of where those emissions originate. So it may be that a portion of the damages here in Texas are coming from the nearby states, and so on and so forth. So we see that Pennsylvania, Texas, and Ohio are the states that have the largest amount of premature mortality occurring between their state boundaries. And so the next layer is I'm trying to disentangle where do those damages come from and who is imposing uh, damages to whom. So the second panel shows the premature mortality inside each state uh, that is associated with emissions uh, that occur within the state boundaries. And so we see that states like Ohio and Pennsylvania still have a large uh, a number of premature mortality, but much smaller than the number that occurs between uh, the state boundaries, meaning the difference between these and what we've seen in panel A are damages that are importing from somewhere else, right? So it may be that in Pennsylvania, they come from Ohio and, and so forth and, and so on. Um, but at the same time, we're able to see who is imposing damages to others. So this third panel shows the premature mortality that occurs outside the state boundaries due to emissions that occur between the state boundaries. So once again, and, and kind of, calling out on Ohio and, and Pennsylvania, 
there are very large numbers here, meaning that these states are imposing a lot of premature deaths. They're simply not occurring between the state boundaries. They are uh, like imposing that elsewhere. So this begs really for uh, cooperation and interstate uh, policy when thinking about how to address these problems. And finally, uh, D, which is the net effect of, um, of these damages. So this net effect is uh, the damages caused to self plus the damages to caused to others minus the deaths that occur between state boundaries. And you see states like New York, which emit very little uh, pollution, but which are amongst the largest ones in terms of the net effects, owing to pollution that occurs in neighboring states and that lands on, on uh, the New York, New York state. Um, what does the negative value mean in there? The negative means that you're importing that amount of damages. So on that, you're suffering those uh, damages between state borders. So some of the key findings from this work is that the average exposures are the highest for Black African American uh, uh, people, followed by non-Latino white, and the exposures for the remaining groups are somehow lower. That the disparities between by race and ethnicity are observed for each income uh, category, indicating that the racial and ethnic differences hold even after accounting for differences in income. And the levels of this, the disparity differ by state and RTO. And we observe that exposures are higher for lower income than higher income, but the disparities are larger by race than income. And that geographically, we observe that there are large differences between where electricity is generated and where people experience the resulting PM2.5 health consequences, with some states being net exporters of health impacts and others net importers. And indeed, for 36 states, we find that most of the health impacts are attributable to emissions in other states. Yes? How do you quantify large differences in where people are exposed and where things are getting emitted? Like, how large is that? Uh, if so you go to the previous slide, like the third to last point, like large differences. Yeah, um, so in addition to the maps that I'm showing here, which indicate where the, uh, whether the damages are to self or the damages that are imposed to others, in the paper itself, uh, we include a matrix on sources and receptors of pollution across the state. So I'm happy to share that. I don't have it in the slides, but happy to share that your way. I got a quick question. Yeah. How do you decouple the many, many other things that cause people to die early from PM 2.5. I'm just curious if there are studies done on the medical side in conjunction with yours that, that did a little more of that because I understand it's a model and there's a lot of assumptions that probably go into the model, but that's the part that I'm having trouble with. That's a, a great question. And just to repeat in case uh, folks didn't, uh, didn't hear online, the question is how do one disentangle the premature mortality that is associated with air pollution versus all other causes of um, premature mortality. And so let me um, start by saying that there is definitely uncertainty there. And in the second uh, part of the, the talk, I'll show the importance of different dose response functions on the differences of increasing in uh, pollution to premature death, how, how important they are actually on the outcomes that, that uh, we can see. Um, and um, I am a user rather than a developer for that research, but the way researchers have gone about this is to study cohorts across different locations and with different levels of exposure, try to disentangle the factors that are other causes of premature mortality across those cohorts and identify where there are changes really just attributable to the different concentrations. So it's really statistical econometric studies that follow those cohorts. There are a few, all with limitations on the identification of the cohorts or other things that may be going on, but that's what we rely on. And that's definitely an important uncertainty associated with, with this. Um, I, I, um, I think that the research has uh, established with a very high level of confidence that there is an association between the level of air pollution and premature mortality from these causes, the magnitude of those effects is still in question. 
So in the uh, second part of the work, uh, we are bringing together what was in my initial slides in terms of climate and air pollution. So up until now, we talked just about the air pollution consequences. One of the other questions that we had was really more on the policy grounds. A lot of attention has been devoted in the past in issues like the uh, clean power plan on the decarbonization of the electricity sector and accounting for air pollution consequences as a co-benefit or an added damage, but really not integrating that into the policy design itself and the goals. And we were wondering how that could change the types of technologies and their locations that one would uh, incentivize to be built up. So in this paper was also a collaborative effort with my former student, Brian Surdy, who is now uh, at NREL, um, several faculty members, Peter Adams, Nick Mueller, Alan Robinson, Stephen Davis, and Julian Marshall. And, um, and uh, as I mentioned, generally climate policies often treat uh, air quality and, and health as co-benefits. And despite the linkages between these two realms, which are tied to sources of emissions like the transportation sector or power plants, very few policies have explicitly considered both when designing uh, improvements about the, those dimensions. And the choice of which power plants are replaced by low emissions alternatives can dramatically alter the health benefits from a given reduction in system-wide emissions. Um, and there has been some previous work, but very limited exploration on how a spatially granular co-optimization of climate and health benefits could affect the emissions reductions across US power plants. So we did that. And our modeling approach was to explore uh, the optimal locations for emissions reductions from the US power sector, um, and including this integrated treatment of climate and health uh, uh, damages associated with air pollution. And so we did this at the county level. Uh, we developed uh, a model for a degree, the capacity retirement and expansion model to, to explore the implications of location while integrating those uh, two dimensions, climate damages and health damages from air pollution, explicitly also in the objective function on decisions about new buildups and requirements. And uh, as a test that we use a policy that exogenously specifies the need to meet the 30% CO2 uh, reduction emission target, which is kind of the, the number to the rounding uh, several existing and proposed policies. And we uh, run this across different scenarios uh, where we aim at minimizing social costs, but in some instances, the social costs explicitly account for the externalities associated with air pollution, whereas in other instances, we just include the costs of build up of the system to uh, meet this policy, as well as the costs imposed by uh, CO2 inaction uh, using the social cost of carbon. Um, and we make several simplifying assumptions. The first one is that the new capacity needs to be built in the same county where a new, uh, an existing plant is being retired or replaced. And the reason for this assumption is to um, avoid the need of additional electricity transmission infrastructure. So. If we relax this assumption, maybe we could have better solar sites or better wind sites, but then we'll need to add the transmission cost assumptions too, and that will, will add for future work. Uh, a little bit more on data and assumptions. So we did uh, detailed um, uh, electricity fleet characterization. So we used the 2017 SEMS data, which has both emissions and generation for all fossil fuel units larger than 25 megawatts. This is a fantastic data set that is put together by the Environmental Protection Agency, um, and, and one that we're always worried that uh, will stop being published at some point, but really tracks hourly basis generation and emissions for uh, all large fossil fuel-based uh, units. Um, and we have unit-level data on CO2, SO2, uh, and NOx emissions, as well as generation, the fuel and unit type, the facility location, including its coordinates, which we then use in the air quality modeling portion. And regarding the greenhouse gases emissions and damages, for uh, the climate change damages, we multiply the CO2 emissions by the social cost of carbon, 
the famous and infamous social cost of carbon for which we assume that $40 uh, per ton of CO2 in 2017 dollars. Um, I'm and just wondering what's the source for that? I guess forty dollars. Yeah, so this is from the interagency working group. I think it was the previous lab to last median, IPCC. close to median estimate. Not IPCC. So the there is an interagency working group from the United States agencies no, that no. over the years has done several studies on the social cost of carbon. There is a more recent one than the number that I have posted yeah. here. Uh, they actually don't post a single number. They post a distribution of numbers and their high or low um, discount rate assumptions. Uh, they have an equivalent assessment even for other greenhouse gases like methane that takes into account the uh, uh, lifetime of methane in the atmosphere. So it's uh, definitely uh, would point you to those resources. With that said, the ranges when you look at the interval range from really very low numbers all the way to over $150 per ton of CO2. All of this depends really on the assumptions. And so in, in our work specifically, we generally do the sensitivity analysis over a wide range of social cost of uh, carbon uh, values given that uncertainty. We also consider the climate impacts associated with methane leakage from the natural gas uh, extraction and distribution. Um, and we assume the MREL um, uh, um, study to back calculate the leakage rate, which we assume to be 3%. Um, and we convert methane to CO2 equivalent using a 100 year global warming potential. Um, the methane leakage is not included in the objective function as something that would need to be achieved. It's just tracked separately as a consequence of increasing the amount of natural gas that we would add to the system. Now, um, for air pollutants, uh, we use also the existing fleet data on the emissions inventory, as uh, previously explained. And then for the damages, we use some, something very similar to what I explained already for the previous paper, so we use the integrated assessment models and do first a baseline run and then a perturbation for the emissions at each power plant. Um, but we add on a few layers that I didn't discuss in the previous work. So the first one is this issue of uh, the importance of the selection of the dose response or concentration response function. We use the two main ones uh, that have been developed in the literature, the ACS study or American Cancer Society and the Harvard CCT study. And as you'll see, the estimates on premature mortality kind of double when you use one versus the other. There's the importance of uh, specifying and showing both. Um, the researchers are leaning more and more to the use of the ACS one as the state of art. Um, and so we use that actually in some of the baseline results. We also were interested about modeling and certainty on these integrated assessment models. So the co-authors in the study have been actually the developers of several of these models, EMAP, Easier, and AP2. And so we use all three of them and contrast the results that emerge across these different integrated assessment models. And just a, a little bit about those different models. They vary uh, a, a little bit in their approach. Uh, AP3 uses a Gaussian pool modeling with very rudimentary uh, chemistry. Easier is a regression-based approximation to a full chemical transport model or CTM. And EMAP has a modeling structure very similar to CTMs, but simplified temporally and in terms of chemistry and physics. So all of them have their different gist to, to, to it. And um, they all also have different uh, grid levels. Uh, so that's the, the other layer. And although these reduced form uh, models are less precise than full-scale uh, chemical transport models, the previous work by um, the researchers involved in the development of those models and, and others have shown that the estimates for annual uh, PM2.5 uh, emission concentrations and resulting health damages are um, quite up in good agreement across these three different models. So we went over the existing fleet, the consequences for the CO2 and emissions damages. Uh, and now the third piece of the puzzle is what are we replacing the existing capacity with? Because that will matter on the costs of achieving those reductions, as well as on the performance and the amount of 
emissions avoided. So we uh, limit the alternatives to three main ones, uh, NGCC, so natural gas combined cycle, or uh, wind or utility scale solar. So a few more details on the assumptions here for NGCC plants. Um, the, the good thing about those is that they emit half, about half of the CO2 in combustion phase um, than uh, coal power plants, and they have far less SO2 and NOx emissions than coal. So they will also uh, result in fewer uh, health consequences. Um, they also have the, the benefit of being very easily dispatchable. And so as we're replacing coal power plants, they will provide the option to have firm um, uh, capacity. And we assume that they are able to meet the same loads as the thermal loads that coal was providing before. Sorry, did you have yeah, a question? The CO2 is an equivalent um, CO2 or it's just um, pure CO2? Because uh, there will be quite a bit of methane emissions right, when it comes to it. That's yeah, okay. so it's plain CO2. This is really use based okay. combustion. And then we track the methane leakage and methane implications separately, not as part of the, this, this function. Yeah. Um, and so we, so we estimate the amount of plant capacity that is needed to be built up um, to replace predominantly coal. Uh, and we assume capacity factors of 56% and heat rates uh, that are based on uh, annual uh, databases. Uh, and we assume that the plants need to be built in increments of 150 megawatts, so we'll increase those until they need the needed generation uh, from the equivalent coal plant that was on site. And uh, to your question, we do account for the upstream emissions from methane leakage. Uh, but not in the effective function. So that's it for NGCC power plants. And then we also provide the option of either wind or utility scale solar. Um, and so for that, we rely, uh, in the case of wind, uh, we use capacity factors from NREL that are location specific and we use average values by county. And in solar, a very similar strategy has been put together by NREL. So we have the irradiance levels and convert that into uh, capacity factors on that will be average at the county level. And now we also make this important assumption, which is if we were to just add wind or solar, and those are mistakes, they wouldn't necessarily meet uh, the amount of generation that is provided by coal in the site. So we impose the storage uh, requirement too. So solar and um, storage or wind and storage are combined to be able to provide that firm power and we include the cost of that added storage too. Um, and we have, uh, we assume the $1,500 per kilowatt of installed storage. The cost of storage is declining very rapidly as well as those of solar. So I think in the near future, we'll be interested in redoing this analysis of the new uh, assumptions of those costs and maybe new insights will emerge. Now, next we compute the cost of mitigation. So this will be the total annual mitigation costs that come from the optimization scenario versus the baseline. What do we include in the objective function? We include both the annualized capital expenditures for all new capacity that needs to be built, as well as all the, um, the sum of the annual fixed costs, O&M, variable costs, and fuel costs. And uh, we subtract from that the reduced O&M and fuel costs from existing coal or natural gas plants that would stop operating or shut down. Um, and for all the assumptions on capital O&M and fuel costs, we rely on uh, NREL's database. For the results that you'll see, though we did then extensive sensitivity analysis, we assume a 20-year lifetime and a 7% discount rate. And then we did a series of sensitivity analysis um, so we designed this linear optimization model that will include the total costs of the system when achieving the 30% CO2 emissions reductions, plus the social cost of carbon tax, the emissions of CO2 for each uh, source of emissions. And then we either include or not this um, uh, additional factor, which is the marginal damages from a pollutant at a specific site times the emissions of that pollutant as a site. And we we'll look at the difference between including or not, not, in, not including the health damages portion explicitly here. So a little bit about results. Um, 
In the vertical axis, I'm showing the annual damages, and we'll look at the annual damages built to, from climate change and from air pollution. And the baseline is indeed the system as we have it today, with the system composition and the mix of coal, natural gas, and renewables that we have today across the US. And so if we do so, and then there's this assumption of $40 per ton of CO2 for the climate damages, the climate damages associated with CO2 emissions are uh, roughly near uh, $70 billion per year. And the air quality related damages then have a wide range. So I'll go over this uh, uh, slowly. The light blue corresponds to uh, the dose response function from the Harvard City study, which is older than the ACS study, um, which is shown in, in sort of navy blue. So you can see already uh, over here how striking it is that the dose response function may make it such that the damages from air pollution are actually more important or less important than the climate change damages alone. Um, and the different symbols, so the circle corresponds to AP3, triangle to EMAP, and square to uh, easier, so the three different air quality models. So we also see the importance of the different air quality models on the overall damages uh, quantification. And across all these three, the, we're using the same value of a statistical life and other underlying assumptions. Now, what happens when we impose a policy that ends up reducing uh, CO2 emissions by 30% and where in the objective function, we just include the costs to the system plus the climate change damages? Well, we see that the optimal strategy then leads us to an emissions reductions of 30% and so an equivalent reduction also on the climate damages by nearly 30%. And uh, as we pursue that climate-only policy, we still have a co-benefit in terms of the health damages being reduced. So this is, this is good as we transition to a decarbonized system, we have the co-benefit indeed to uh, air pollution reductions. So the annual uh, health damages decrease from uh, being between 34 and $120 billion in the baseline to being between 13 and 50 billion in the climate only scenario. So achieving a 30% CO2 uh, reduction target using a climate only approach sees, still yields annual health benefits that range between 21 and 68 billion relative to the current baseline. So that's the difference between these scenarios in this scenario. Now, what happens if we account explicitly for the health damages when making the decisions of where to retire fire plants and what to build. And so what we see is that once again, we assume uh, we meet the constraint of reducing CO2 emissions by 30%, um, but we have this additional reduction in health damages that occurs by explicitly accounting for, for the health damages in the charity function. Um, so when health is explicitly considered as a co-objective, the range of annual damages now falls from four to $40 billion, meaning the uh, annual health benefits associated with the decrease in pollution range from between 30 and $140 billion per year. And now economists in the room, if there are any, would uh, start asking me how much does this cost? Because right now we're just looking and health damages and the associated benefits. So let's look at that next. Um, in this slide, in the vertical axis, we have the annual benefits in billion dollars. C corresponds to looking at the climate policy alone and tracking the health damages as co-benefit. H plus E means uh, optimizing jointly for health damages and climate damages. Um, and then we have the series of scenarios for each of the air quality models. Um, and the uh, orange bars correspond to the annual benefits in terms of uh, GHG emissions reductions. The blue bars correspond to the health benefits from reduced air pollution. And the, um, the green bars correspond to the mitigation costs that are associated with building new power plants and retiring uh, part of the existing capacity. The diamonds correspond to the net benefits, which are all positive, meaning that society overall, if aiming to internalize the damages from air pollution from climate change, would be better off by pursuing these investments versus the status quo. 
Um, and a, a little bit about some of the key uh, comparisons. We do see that the costs increase by about one billion to, in some cases, two billion dollars per year, when explicitly including uh, health as part of the portfolio. But overall, the net benefits are also, so the diamonds are also increased by explicitly incorporating health into the decisioning process. So, oh, yeah. Did you also model who is seeing those health benefits demographics-wise in the optimization? Yeah, so we'll get to that oh, yeah, in a little sorry. bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to the same extent as the previous one, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit on, on that in a couple of slides. So the question was about who uh, benefits uh, from the health benefits, and so we'll, we'll get to that in just a little bit. Could you also talk more about what those benefits are specifically? So the benefits are uh, premature mortality reduction due to exposure to air pollution. That's that's exactly what's in this blue bar. So that's yeah. translated into a cost? And that's translated into an avoided cost as you reduce the pollution. Yeah. So this whole thing is annual benefits in terms of reducing premature mortality that you otherwise have uh, had if you sustain high pollution levels. So the healthcare system that we see. Yes. So this is generally so we use the value of statistical life, which is the um, value that is used by national agencies and, and others as um, a proxy for the value that you have associated with taking jobs that have different risk levels, for example. It doesn't include the costs to the healthcare system in terms of um, uh, uh, treatment and so on. It doesn't. So it's it's kind of a different perspective. That could be done too. And that would be an interesting uh, added analysis. Yeah. Uh, so under the baseline assumptions, the model builds primarily natural gas with a modest amount of wind, uh, concentrated primary locations where wind uh, has a really is a really good resource. Um, but the mitigation costs are very sensitive to natural gas prices. So we range scenarios from ranging from current prices to tripling the gas prices, given the uncertainty on future prices. Um, and that would, of course, translate to increased cost of mitigation. Um, and as we increase the price of natural gas, uh, then the selection of technologies between the models starts to be more uh, building more uh, wind with storage rather than natural gas. Um, a little bit about the health damages, where they occur under the baseline and in the different locations. So getting first at your question, and then we'll see other lenses of this. Uh, on the top left, we have the baseline. So this is where um, the premature mortality is incurred, regardless of where it is emitted under the current uh, conditions. And the circles correspond to where coal power plants are located and the amount of generation from those coal plants uh, which are shared in terms of, of color. And the second panel shows the what happens under the climate policy. So we see that several of the coal power plants uh, in these regions are uh, retired as part of that climate change mitigation goal. And the parent too is that we do have benefits in terms of the health damages associated with pollution in most locations. And when including the climate and the air policy, first, not the, we see that the power plants that get retired and removed are not necessarily the same ones. So we still see some prevalence of these power plants that had disappeared in the climate only policy. And we see even a further increase in uh, reductions from um, health damages from air pollution. Now, a little bit on equity and environmental justice. Uh, do you see those as being critical to consider when thinking about the locations of where plants are going to be removed and where new infrastructure is going to be built up? And um, uh, the worry here is that the policy that will optimize for just net benefits at the expense of specific groups may not be desirable, uh, specifically if some of those groups are low income, racial minorities, elderly, or other at risk populations which already tend to experience poor air quality and higher health damages from air pollution, as we've seen in the previous uh, work. And so here our analysis are computing things at county level. So we can say some things, but we'll need much more detailed data uh, to establish further evidence. But um, to give you a sense of some of the findings, in um, 
this plot, we show the median uh, annual health benefits. And we look at those distributed across the nation by income quantile, from the lowest quantile to the highest one. And we're looking at the health benefits from reduced air pollution when you have a policy just focused on climate, that's the dark blue bars, or climate plus health, where you have added benefits. So a good thing is that we see um, health benefits from these policies across all income quantiles, and we see added benefits across all income quantiles when we look at health plus climate. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just mention that, and that the, the largest uh, benefits actually occur on the low income, income quantiles rather than the high ones. Now, we've looked at this also in terms of the share of minority uh, people in a county from lowest amount of minority in the county to the highest uh, quantile with uh, population minority in a, a county. And in contrast to income, we find that counties with lower shares of minority population are the ones that accrue the most health benefits, regardless of the optimization strategy. Now, again, in terms of who would need to bear the burden of those replacements, the policy definition, whether it's just climate or climate for plus health, would have tremendously different impacts across the states. Uh, so over here to the left, we have the new capacity that would need to be installed in gigawatts. The orange bars correspond to the climate only scenario. The blue bars correspond to the health plus climate, uh, um, um, health damages plus climate change damages being explicitly included. Uh, and you have a list of a few of the, um, the states. The axis on the right represent the share of existing capacity in the state that would need to be replaced, and that corresponds to the black diamonds over here. Um, so you see that some states really go from a very low amount of uh, capacity that would need to be replaced, about 12%, to more than 50% of the state capacity needing to be replaced if we think about health plus climate scenarios. So this has tremendous implications for the design of policy and for the, the, the um, state's own investments in new infrastructure. So I'll move to a summary. So we see that improved air quality and human health are often discussed as a co-benefit or a side issue in climate change mitigation, yet they are rarely considered when designing and implementing climate policies. And so we analyze the implications of integrating health and climate when determining the best locations for replacing power plants with wind, solar, and natural gas, and to meet an example of a CO2 a nationwide reduction target of 30%. We develop the capacity expansion model, we couple that with integrated assessment uh, models of damages and compared, and, and compared portfolios. I'll say that all of this has been established as open source code, so that if any of you are interested in exploring other aspects associated with these issues, you're more than welcome to do so. There is plenty of work that could be developed um, in addition to what we've done to date. Um, we explicitly tackled uncertainty on model formulation by using three integrated assessment models and on concentration response functions by using the two major ones and really find that reducing CO2 by 30% would hold uh, benefits to health too, ranging from 21 to 68 billion per year. And additional benefits uh, between nine and 36 billion per year being possible when co-optimizing climate and health benefits. And the health benefits can equal or exceed the climate benefits ever over a wide range of modeling assumptions. Again, this will depend on what you assume for the social cost of carbon, what you assume for a value of statistical life, one, um, the health damages portion and so on. Um, and additional benefits accrue in prioritizing emissions reductions in counties with high population exposure. This is kind of a given from um, the, the introduction slides. Um, and, and finally, really this begs for considering both those attributes in policy design as well as thinking about interstate cooperation when thinking about infrastructure plans. And so I'll end with that, and we can open for discussion uh, or questions. Thank you so much for being here in person or 
online. We're gonna have like two minutes, I guess, for 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 questions or comments. Yeah. Yes. I'm just curious about the necessity of a, a co-benefit model because it seems like currently the US already has robust policies when it comes to air pollution. We have the Clean Air Act, um, the Asset Rain Program regulations on PM. So it seems like that is already being handled and we only need to kind of like look at the climate side so that overall we are optimizing for both. So I was just wondering yeah, what you think about that. Yeah, so it, it is the case. So the question was, do we really need to look at uh, the air quality portion given that we already have some air quality policy in places through the Clean Air Act, whereas in the climate, we still have a long way to go. And so hopefully the message that I conveyed was not uh, a lack of urgency in tackling the climate change policy uh, problem and getting those regulations into play. It is though that the air pollution damages are not yet a minor issue, even with the Clean Air Act and with the progress that we have pursued. Uh, this is still an issue that has a large magnitude and where explicitly accounting for it can play a role. Not only that, but where the interaction between that and other um, climate-driven or sustainable energy policies will uh, further uh, get uh, an increase in importance, such as vehicle electrification, uh, both on the light duty and we start trying to electrify all potential end uses, even if the grid is cleaner, it will still constitute a large majority of damages. So um, my, my group, for example, is looking at the consequences of electrifying vehicles across the nation and whether that's a, that's a good thing versus a bad thing when compared to gasoline or diesel or hybrid vehicles, depending on where you are and where you charge your vehicle with. And the story, again, may be a little bit different if you look at just uh, GHGs versus GHGs plus air pollution. Um, but to your point, even more important than the case study that we observed here uh, for the United States, we're developing a lot of work in India and hopefully we'll have also focus in China in the future, where those trade-offs are even less clear in India. The air, pollutant, uh, air pollution control technologies are still not there out of the stack, so the premature mortality is of utmost importance. In China, it's a little bit more underway. Um, but still, the damages are going to be large. So this is also kind of a framework that can be applied to other locations across the nation where the air pollution consequences are even more damaging um, than what you see in the United States. Very long answer, which brings us to 2.30, but there is one more pressing question having to take that on. Otherwise, we'll conclude and vote for folks online and here in the room. Uh, oh, there is one pressing question. <laughs> might be a quick note, but uh, I was wondering if like when you're taking um, all your data from the different bins of different demographics, if you kind of accounted for if it's even um, a thing or not, if like some of the different demographics are um, not as reported and if you're out of them. Yeah. So, so in a nutshell, we rely on the census data. So whatever is on the census data, we're able to use, but we are not looking at other sources of information to complement the results of, of the census. But happy to talk more than offline uh, about that and on the details and any suggestions that you may have in terms of complementing those, those data sets too. Um, and and uh, to, to everyone, feel free to reach me via email if you have any additional comments or questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, next seminar is next week, same time, 1.30. Uh, the speaker is uh, Professor Bomaya from UC Berkeley. She's going to talk about a, a project in Oakland.